consequence, the topics that I address should not be as superficial as I would if I was lecturing to an audience with less experience. But the other edge of the two-edged sword, when I started looking at the education of the people that have come to the Institute over the last two decades, is that those that have 15, 25 years experience, most of them take their education periodically by hearing 30 different speakers talk for 30 minutes, showing their best cases in the last five years. And as a consequence, although they have a wide range of clinical experience, they start evolving into treatment planning by art form, doing things by what's popular this year, rather than going back in to the basics of the sciences of what we do, and what is the rationale for what we do. And so I'm going to take the opportunity of these several hours with this very mature group to talk about the field, hopefully things that you already know, but hopefully also to give you some basis of why certain things have more science and certain things have more art form associated with them. So why don't we begin? Let's turn down the lights if we can. That's possible. Um, most of the material that I give today will be in this book. And this is uh, a book that evolved originally was a book on treatment planning, surgery, and prosthetics. It's evolved into now this edition is just treatment planning and surgery. The prosthetic portions have been removed. But since I'm talking about either bone grafting or treatment planning today, most of the material that I presented that will present will be documented and referenced within that book. When I look at the basis of the development of a treatment plan, one of the things that many of us have said is that we should look at the prostheses. We should look at the final restoration. I was asked for the first half of this program, in fact, more than half of this program, to talk about treatment planning from the end result of the prostheses forward. And so let me start with what is the basis of developing a treatment plan. And there's an axiom of of stress that I've brought to the Institute over the last couple of decades. You know, when you go to a certain program, let's say in Periwood in Boston, you know you're going to have a strong surgical foundation for period surgery. If you went to University of Michigan, it'd be a pharmacological background of pharmacology. Where you get trained has a certain imprint on you of the way that you look at the world within your discipline. And one of the consistent things that I've had within the Institute now for 25 years is that from the very beginning, the Institute was founded on the science of biomechanics. And within that then, over this last two and a half decades, I've evolved into an axiom that I'll call the stress axiom for implant dentistry. If I take our field, the field of dentistry at large and implants more specifically, we have a science and we have an art form. If I look at the sciences of dentistry, we start out taking gross anatomy, we end up with head and neck anatomy. We end up with gross pathology, we end up with head and neck pathology. And we study for four years the sciences of dentistry. And then when we get out, we never look at the science again, as a general rule. When we get out, we start looking at the art form of the field. We look at the art form of aesthetics, and we look at the art form of management, and we look at the art form and all of a sudden, we start asking our professors, what do you think about? Rather than saying, what do you have studies to show about? And we give so much flexibility to the people that lecture that it's become basically an art form of this works in my hands, or the five cases that I'm showing you. We study aesthetics also as a science as possible. Highly each width of a tooth that I restore, I give the laboratory technician based on a science of aesthetics. I'll give the incisal edge position at the chair based not on the central incisor. I wrote a paper several years ago that showed that the central incisor is the least predictable place to find in a partially or completely edentulous maxilla that there's a range of almost 8 millimeters. When I read the studies of Vig and Bruno, there's a range of almost 8 millimeters to come up with an average of 3 millimeters for the young, 2 millimeters for the middle age, and a millimeter for the age. 
Yeah, that's an average, but the average is a range of eight numbers. It goes from a negative three to a positive nine. And as a consequence, when you use an average for a central incisor, you're wrong 80% of the time. And as a consequence, we don't use the central incisor as a guide of the aesthetic position of it. We use the canine position that has a range of less than three millimeters. And as a consequence, the average makes more sense. We develop the height of the tooth by the smile line so that we look at the interdental papillae, but not the tissue above, by the art form of what is the smile based on aesthetics. And the, so the height of each tooth is based on the lip translation. And then I'll look at the height and width ratios to come up with what the width of the tooth should be based on the science of aesthetics. I hired two technicians from Europe and we started making our own porcelain, pink porcelains, to replace the soft tissue gray because we found, indeed, at that point, there were only three colors of pink that we could buy and none of them looked like soft tissue, so we had to start making our own based on the science of ceramics. We found that it's better to add 10, 15 bakes to a case to control the shrinkage and decrease the fracture rather than the original one or two bakes is what was being taught to us at that point based on the science of ceramics. And again, I would now give the height and width of each tooth that I restore based on the science of aesthetics and the height of the papillae. And then each restoration is characterized so that they don't all look the same because indeed all our patients are different. And so the soft tissue drape and aspects is customized to look different for each patient that we have. And within that, then, the science of aesthetics, I return my original goal taught to me by Hill Tatum, starting out his lectures back 30 years ago when I take them, is our goal is to return a patient to normal contour, comfort, function, aesthetic, speech, and health. And within that, then, those goals are obtained whether we're working on teeth or working on titanium roots, as I have here. And whether I use porcelain metal or porcelain teeth to acrylic with a metal framework depends on the crown height space. And within that, all of us will look at this restoration and know that these are not natural teeth. They are a prosthesis. But the goal is to come close enough that we fool the public's eye, especially when it's not magnified a thousand times, into thinking that these look like teeth based on the science of aesthetics. And yet, many of us allow the technician to control most all of that. And it turns out to be the ability of a technician to give us an aesthetic and result. And I remind the people that I train that as gifted as our technicians may and are, they're not called doctor. We're called doctor not because of the art form in our field, we're called doctor because of the science in our field. And yet we abandon the science when we graduate. And we go only to the art. Well, if I go back to the sciences and start building upon the sciences and developing a treatment plan, we have basically two fundamental sciences in dentistry. We have biologic sciences and biomechanical science. <clears throat> the biologic sciences are what we concentrate on. Not only gross anatomy and head and neck anatomy, and not only wound healing, and not only bacteria found in the mouth. We concentrate on biologic sciences largely because that's what we treat. We treat periodontal disease, we treat caries, we treat lesions of endodontic origin, and they have a genesis most often centered around biology. And it makes sense then that that's what we're schooled. When we're a freshman in dental school, we get a 45-minute lecture on biomechanics. And the foundation for that lecture is because when we do fixed partial dentures, the most common complications include not only biologic complications, but biomechanical things, unretained restoration and fracture. And so we get a short lecture on crown retention form. And we get a lecture maybe on fatigue fracture. <coughs> But we never get a lecture again. And in fact, no discipline in dentistry ever talks about biomechanics again, with the exception of orthodontics or anchorage. The field of dentistry ignores biomechanics largely. And it makes sense because we treat conditions related to biology. But the problem is when you enter the field of implant dentistry, the vast majority of complications are not biologic. They are biomechanics. Based. 
But as a consequence of our training, we keep looking at these problems through biologic eyes, and we come up to the wrong conclusion repeatedly. And then our manufacturers manufacture products that give us the wrong direction because they're based on the biology of the assumption that's wrong to begin with. And the problems that we have today were the problems we were talking about 20 years ago because our foundation has been incorrect. The foundation for implant dentistry should be based on biomechanics. And 25 years ago, the axiom that I hypothesize now has been overwhelmingly proved. And that outside of the aesthetic aspect of dentistry, most all science is in implant treatment is centered around the biomechanical aspect of stress and strain and other related issues. In its most simplest form, stress equals force divided by area. We'll look at force a number of different ways and area a number of different ways. And I'm starting this lecture very basic. I apologize. But what I've seen is that for the next five minutes, I'm going to talk about things that every one of you know, but when you sit at the chair, you start looking at the art form. For example, all of us know there's a difference between a tooth and an implant. You drop a weight on a board with a spring, the spring absorbs some of the intensity of the loads, and the impulse of the force is reduced. You drop a load on a board that's rigid, the impact force, the impulse of the force is higher. Of course, the top represents a tooth with a periodontal membrane and the movement associated with it, and the bottom represents an integrated implant and the force associated with that. We all know that. You put a lateral force on the tooth, it rotates two thirds down the apex. The modulus of elasticity of the tooth is the same as the bone that surrounds it. It's surrounded by a cortical plate. The cribiform plate is cortical in nature. That's not an anatomic structure. You take the tooth out, it disappears. It is a structure based on the biology and the biomechanics of load. You take a lateral load on an implant, it captures the force at the press of the ridge. And the system gets higher stresses in it. And the system includes the porcelain, the cement seal, the abutment screw, the implant components, the surrounding bone, especially the crest. And the system has higher forces. You take people with their own teeth, you ask them to hold a peanut between their teeth for three seconds, and then bite through the peanut, they have no trouble doing that. You have upper and lower implants in a patient, hold the peanut between your teeth, they can do it, bite through the peanut, they bite down the teeth hit with four times the higher force because the proprial awareness is less. It's like when you have a bone and a piece of meat that you're unaware of, you're sure off the cusp. Because your jaws don't stop before the teeth occlude. Your jaws have an elliptical pattern, but right before they occlude, the jaw stops. The speed of the force is reduced. The implants don't have that proprial awareness, and the teeth end up banging four times harder. And as a consequence, the whole system is at a higher risk. It has a higher impact force, it has less mobility, which in biomechanics is a problem, not a benefit. It's a problem, not a benefit. The fact that the teeth, the rib plants are so rigid means there are poor abutments biomechanically, not better abutments. And we'll address that as we go through this. And they have less inclusive awareness, and everybody knows that. And that side of your brain, you can pass a test. In fact, many of you have passed the AID test with no problem. But then when you go back to the patient, you try to make the crown look like a tooth. The occlusion is like a tooth. If you have a problem, you treat it by hygiene and treat it like a tooth. And it doesn't make sense. It's not a tooth. It's an implant. And the science is never brought to the chair. It's like taking a year course in pharmacology, knowing what the drug should be, but when you get in the clinic floor, you prescribe the drug of a guy that's on the floor for the last 25 years, hasn't taken a course, and you say, well, what do you do here? You say, I give him penicillin. And you start writing penicillin based on the art form of the field rather than the science. I remind you that when I talk about the system that has a higher stress component in it, I'm not talking about just the implant. I'm talking about the occlusal porcelain, the cement on the screw, the abutment screw, the marginal bone, the implant bone interface, and the implant components. All of them have higher stresses in them than the natural two. And so if I review our most common complications that we have over the last 30 years, early loading failure, I'll address. The mechanical problems that we see, primarily in prosthetics, and the marginal bone loss. 
Some of these are obvious, but let me, again, with a perspective of foundation, since I'm allowed to lecture for more than 20 minutes today, let me give a foundation of why I'm going to base the rest of the lecture based on biomechanics, not art form, not what works well in my hand, but what works well in the 3,500 guys that I've trained. Early loading failure. Early loading failure. See, failure in implant dentistry is different than failure on teeth, and this causes us a practice problem. If I look at an actual tooth above us being used to replace missing teeth between them, most often in dentistry, the fixed partial denture. Well, the fixed partial denture, how long do they last? We're very much aware that the first five years, this is, these are reports of five years by prosthodontists in our field, and they have very high survival rates. If I take some of the larger studies within the first five years, a failure rate somewhere from two to Y and Zarb have one of the worst studies, 15%. I always point that out because Zarb and I fought our whole career. And I'd say, look, if you're having 15% failure on your bridges on teeth the first five years, sit down and take a course of fixed partial denture before you talk about implants. But that's a joke. <laughs> and nobody laughs. You're going to be a tough one. Because <laughs> many of you know it may not be a joke. No, that's a joke. <laughs> anyway, if we look at what Glantz did, unlike the others, he looked at these same patients after 15 years. And he found his failure rate was 32% with that same population group. They had a great five-year survival, but one out of three were out and off by 15 years. In other words, with natural tooth abutments, they have great survival rates in the beginning. Over enough time, they start having problems. But over enough time, the patient forgets when they have it done. They feel that the service provided by what they paid for is worthwhile. When it has to be redone, there's less resistance to have it redone. We know that the smaller bridges have a higher survival rate than the larger bridges. That the number of contexts in the span decreases the success rates. They're not all the same. The success rates actually decrease in long span bridges than in short span bridges. There shouldn't all be assumed to be a three and a bridge because the data is clearly different. But again, it's a long term failure. It's not a short term failure. And if I look at the reason why they fail, it's primarily because of decay or failed endo or complications. If I take all the data together and add them together at 10 years, one out of three are out of the mouth, and by 15 years, one out of two are out of the mouth when I do a fixed partial venture. Why do they fail? Primarily because of biology. Caries and endo. Caries and endo. And because caries is such a strong component of the failure, the success rates are very high early on, and the failure is partly responsible because the patient didn't use a floss threader, because it most often decays on the interproximal margin next to the ponic, which acts as a plaque reservoir. And as a consequence, the patient is the reason it failed, the lack of hygiene. And it worked for the first five, ten years. There's little resistance to have this prosthesis redone. The second most common reason is related to endo, when you prepare a vital tooth, up to 6% of the time, the tooth becomes devital because you put a burr on top of it, not because you did it wrong, but that's our aspect of preparing teeth. And if I look at the survival rate of endo, about a 10% failure rate of endo over 8 years. In fact, two meta-analyses by endodontists found about a 10% failure rate within 8 years. And since this is the, most, the second most common reason a fixed prosthesis fails, we have to look then that the endo may be a problem. In addition, the failure of the endo, the tooth that has the endo is more likely to fracture. The dentin of the endodontically treated tooth becomes desiccated and inelastic. The inelasticity of the dentin is decreased following time. The change in the collagen cross-linking and dehydration of the dentin results in a 14% reduction in the strength and toughness of the endodontically treated molar. And if I look at a study by Priest as far as why single teeth are lost, endodontic failure was the number one reason and tooth fracture was the number two. Tooth fracture of a vital tooth? Usually not. Tooth fracture of an endo tooth. And as a consequence of endo being the second most common reason a bridge fails, it's another biologic condition from the decay or other that we have to look at. In fact, if the tooth has endo prior to the bridge being fabricated, there's a four times higher risk that the abutment tooth will be lost. And questions the fact whether the abutment should have endo in it 
in the beginning with four times higher risk. And that whether the tooth is vital or devital makes a difference in survival rates as a bonus for fixed partial dentin. So that endodontically treated teeth as an abutments don't have the survival rate of non-endodontically teeth treated as abutments for a fixed partial denture. You already know that. You've probably heard me talk about it or some others talk about it. Again, I'm reviewing the basis that a bridge with natural abutments has a long-term failure. The single tooth implant. The single tooth implant, ever since Becker's original study at 90% for four years, there's been many 10-year studies reported the one that we recently reported, 97 to 99% survival rates at the end of 10 years. A higher survival rate than anything else that's in the industry. But when they fail, the mode of failure and the time of failure is completely different. The good news is they fail less often. The bad news is that when they fail, when the implant fails, it fails early in the process. We'll call it an early loading failure. See, it doesn't fail from the biology. You drill a round hole into a piece of bone and put an implant into it. The implant integrates 99.4% of the time. I've now been involved in 12 prospective studies with either students or with mature clinicians. And if there is abundant bone present, you drill a round hole, you put an implant in, and you don't load it, that implant integrates 99.4% of the time. That's the biology of wound healing. We'll tell the patients, the, the residents, look, the patient doesn't die during the next four months. That implant's integrated. But then you load it, and the implant fails within the first year, year and a half. Not after 10 years because of decay. Implants don't decay and they don't need endo. That's the reason why their long-term survival rates are so good. But when they have a problem, it's early in the system. And that early failure is different for you in the practice. The patient doesn't feel responsible for it. You can't tell them it's because of bad hygiene. They'll say, well, how come I didn't lose any other tooth? It's not bad hygiene. And the patient ends up with a less syndrome because of the failure they have less bone. Because of the failure they have less time to have this thing finished before the certain event in their life they were trying to get their teeth for. They have less money. They paid for the surgery at work. They paid for the prosthetics. It was delivered. And then it failed. And they have less confidence in the profession because everybody told them that this is very predictable, but it didn't work for them. And now they're looking at you and the team through a jaundiced eye. The doctor suffers from the less syndrome. The doctor then has less bone, they have to do a bone prep. Well, I don't care who you are in the field. You can't get bone grafting ending up with ideal hard and soft tissue 99.4% of the time. In other words, if the patient had a failure, you're now doing a procedure that's less predictable than the original procedure and puts you even more at risk for litigious problems or other things because of consecutive failures in the same patient. You have less money because the failure occurs so early in the system, you feel as though you should do the bone graft for nothing, re-implant for nothing, add the abutment for nothing, redo the transitionals for nothing, and redo the final prosthesis for nothing. And if you elect not to, the patient reminds you that their neighbor's an attorney or something else. And between your feeling that you should and the litigious risk, you end up eating the case. And if I had more time to explore that issue, you'd find that one failure costs you the profits of as many as six to eight good cases when you have to add a bone graft into it that you're doing for free. And that a 10% failure may be indeed you're only getting paid for one or two cases out of every 10 that you do. And therefore, it's prudent because of the early failure to start looking at the cause, although the cause, the frequency is less. The problem is very significant. And the cause of this early loading failure, let me show you some studies that we've done with macaque over the last 30 years. This is a macaque fascicularis. It's the large rhesus monkey. Our medical colleagues use the rhesus monkey because they're smaller, they're easier to house, they eat less. The macaque is larger. But the advantage of the macaque, its genetic structure is the same, it's less than 3% different than human, and we're able to put dental implants that we can put in people, 7 millimeters, 9 millimeters, we can't get much bigger than that, but we're able to use an implant commercially available for them. Let me show you several studies done with the macaque by several authors. Isidore, 
16 implants are integrated. Takes eight of them and puts crowns with premature contacts. Takes eight of them and puts strings in the sulcus with no hygiene to increase plaque retention following the Beagle Dog model of Imperial. When the implants have plaque build up with the strings in the sulcus for two years, no implants fail. When the implants have premature contacts on crowns, six out of eight implants fail within the first 18 months. These implants fail from low, not bacteria. They failed from low, not bacteria. There was more bone loss on the implants that didn't fail, and the implants became mobile because of load, not bacteria. If I look at it from the biomechanical perspective, if I take a load which is forced on a material, the higher the force, the more the material changes shape. The less the load, the less the material changes shape, and you get a slope of a line that's related to the amount of load and the amount of change in shape. Engineers call load stress, force over error. They'll call change in length strain, which is a change in length over the original length, and it's a percent. And again, the higher the stress, the higher the strain. And that line is different for different types of materials. And it's called the elastic modulus. The change in shape, it turns out, is a vital importance both in fracture and in bone. In fact, Frost and now many others have looked at the change in shape of bone cells and found when a bone shell changes shape, a different physiologic response occurs. There's a stress that's not enough, the bone disappears. This is like taking out a tooth and not putting an implant. 30% of the bone disappears within the first year. The strain to that surrounding bone is less. The cribriform plate disappears. You put a strain so great, the bone breaks. It fractures. But the range in between can either keep the bone ideal or turn it to fibrous tissue. The fibrous tissue area is pathologic overload. Well, why is that relevant? If I take 50 units of stress and put it on a piece of titanium, it changes this much shape. If I put this much units of stress on bone, it changes this much shape. And bone and titanium are different. Bone's more flexible and the change in shape, when that micro strain becomes in the pathologic overload, the bone disappears because of too much stress, leading to too much strain in the bone. It's a biomechanical result. That equation was first shown to me 30 years ago by Jack Lemons. If we decrease the stress down to 10 units, the micro strain between the bone and the titanium is less. And as a consequence, when it's less, it's more apt to be in the physiologic loading zone and the bone stays organized and healthy and the implant is maintained. So the goal to decrease the risk is to decrease the biomechanical stress. In fact, one of our residents at UAB, it's the only school I'm aware of in the world that gives a master's and PhD in dental implant engineering, of which we've studied bone and titanium and interfaces now for 25 years. One of my last residents that got her PhD thesis in this measured the angstrom movement of the bone cell next to titanium for these different levels of physiologic responses. So we literally know what these numbers are today. And indeed, if the bone is a little bit too much, it changes the fibrous tissue. If it's loaded ideally with less strain, it's organized, becomes strong, load-bearing bone. It is a change in shape of the bone cell that triggers these responses. Well, what's relative to building a treatment plan then? Well, let's look at the clinical complications. A study was done by Loma Linda, headed by their dean, and they looked at all the articles written from 1989 to 2003 that had anything of complications of failure and put them in different categories. And when they looked at all the different categories up to 2003, the two categories that had the highest implant failure were when implants were placed in the softest bone type or when implants were less than 10 millimeters long. Those two conditions led to a higher failure rate than any of the 100 other conditions that were reported during that 20 year period. Both of those causes of failure are related to biomechanics, not hygiene, not bacteria. Soft bone and too little area for the load. The bone density then. The bone density should be addressed. The upper jaw is different than the lower jaw. And if I give a summary of this, the upper jaw being different than the lower jaw, the lower jaw is a force absorption unit. The maxilla is a force dissipation unit. It dissipates the force around the orbit, around the brain to protect the organism at large. In fact, around the ear, so you can hear while you eat. 
a different mechanism for how it transfers the force. And because the bone responds to what its function is, the bone is different. The man will teeth, thicker outer cortical plate, coarser trabecular bone, because it absorbs the force. The maxilla, even with teeth, thinner cortical plate, thinner trabecular bone. The bone is different between the upper jaw and the lower jaw. And in fact, when our residents looked at the actual strength of the human bone, we found on a scale of 10, that D1 bone was like a 9 or a 10, D2 bone like a 7 or an 8, D3 bone was 50% weaker. It's like a 3 or a 4, and D4 bone is a 1 or a 2. D3, D4 bone, 50% to 90% weaker than D2, D1 bone. And yet what I see most often when it comes to treatment planning, especially in these weekend approaches, is the same number of implants are used in the maxilla as in the mammal. In fact, all on four, that was around 30 years ago. It's still being done today, and the only thing that's different is we immediately load it. But the number of implants is the same between the upper jaw and the lower jaw. That's based on no science. No science. That's based on art form. Indeed, there's no science that supports that. And if I'm asked to talk about developing a treatment plan, I'm going to base it on science, not on art form. And if I'm 50 to 90 percent weaker in one arch than another, I should do something different in each of those. They shouldn't be treated the same. And indeed, when I look at the studies that include bone density in them, and most of them don't, see, most of our studies now are designed by manufacturers to sell product. And the end result is they always work. But if you look at the handful of studies that come out of here that include all the ranges of bone, see, most of you don't, if you're not publishing as many articles as some of us in the audience have, you don't know that the author is allowed to have exclusion criteria all the time. And exclusion criteria means that smokers are taken out of the study. Soft bone is taken out of the study. Implants shorter than 12 millimeters are taken out of the study. Diabetics are taken out of the study. And because most all of these studies that are being reported are retrospective, you're allowed to look at your data and say, okay, we got a bunch of failures here. What exclusion criteria would eliminate them? And all of a sudden that becomes part of the exclusion criteria. And they end up with the best cases that they've done, and they publish it, everybody ends up 90% or more. You look at the handful of studies that don't take out exclusion criteria at the end, and they're having failure rates still. Wayne and Tarnow, 2003, still was reporting a 40% failure in soft bone. And Tarnow is one of our most popular speakers around the country. But you never hear them talking about it at 3i, where that's when they publish their data, they put that exclusion criteria there. And their data went up to 90%. And so if you actually look at the studies that include all the ranges of bone, as Goodacre did at Loma Linda, 16% failure early on. Don't forget that this is implant failure. The average implant prosthesis has three implants, which means if you have a 15% failure, one implant fails, the whole prosthesis fails. A 15% implant failure may affect 45% of the prosthesis. Can be a problem. Let's look at the short implants. The co consequence of that, of treating the upper jaw like the lower jaw, or soft bone like hard bone, is you have a higher failure rate within your clinical practice, based on biomechanics. The short implant. Every manufacturer sells implants by length. They imply they're all the same. They file an F10K to the government saying, we're the same as everybody else. In order to get a 510K in the United States through the FDA, you file a paper saying, we're using similar materials, similar things as everybody else does that's already accepted. Please accept us without any studies. And almost always the FDA says, fine. And then when they get their FDA approval through a 510K, they go to the profession and say, we're different. Now, if they went to the FDA and said we're different, they'd have to do studies. So they'll never say that they're different to the FDA. They only say they're different to us. Because now they're trying to sell you something. What they don't tell you is in their, their data, they report they exclude implants that are shorter. Okay. It's an exclusion criteria. 
when they present it to the FDA. And the FDA has a rule that if you're having a problem, you're supposed to contact us. Guess what? In 30 years, they've never been contacted. <laughs> and then the most common treatment plan I see around the world is the same as it was 30 years ago. When you have a lot of bone, you put in many and long implants, and when you have less bone, you put in fewer and short implants. And the drive-in treatment plan is the existing bone. And there's no rational biomechanics based on this because basically the upper jaw is being treated like the lower jaw. And when the crown height is tall, you're putting in fewer and shorter implants. It makes no sense at all. And then manufacturers, of which there's many, which there's all of them, tell you there's no difference in size. And if you use them, you'll have no failures. Well, I did a literature review. And I looked for papers that have been published that included all the implant links with no exclusion criteria. I only could find 22 articles. There were 13,000 articles published in the last 30 years and less than 25 that include all the implant links. Hmm. But when I look at it, clearly there's a lot that have below 85% survival rates. <clears throat> clearly there's a lot that have below the average of 85%. If I look at some of the larger studies, MIMS, over six years, 80 different doctors they collected data from, six different implant designs. When these 80 doctors did implants 10 to 16 millimeters long, they lost 5% of their implants. When they put in implants 7 to 9 millimeters long, they lost 16% of the implants. And I remind you, this may be three times a prosthesis failure. Winkler. Winkler here in Boston. 33 different hospitals. All the surgeons are oral surgeons, all the restoring dentists are graduate programs. Seven millimeter implants, 25% failure. Eight millimeter implants, 16% failure. And here's the crux. These implants didn't fail the first year. And as a consequence, the most common thing I hear from a podium, or at our meetings we go to, is all implants are the same. They all work. Well, it's true. They all were the first year. These implants failed after loading. And they failed primarily during that first year and a half. It's a loading problem, not a surgical problem. And the loading problem was insufficient area. Let's look at the study with 3 eye and time. This is published in 2003. The seven millimeter implant failed 25% of the time. The eight and a half millimeter implant 20% of the time. The 10 millimeter implant, 10% of the time. Clearly, there's a difference by implant length. Yet, one of the most common things I hear in treatment planning is people will say, well, the patient didn't want a sinus graft. I'm going to mention this a couple times as we develop a treatment plan. There's two particular things when I hear a patient doesn't want something. Of course they don't want it. It's another surgery, it costs more, it delays the treatment, of course they don't want it. They have a motivation, financially, they don't want it. They're going to pay for it, wait longer, and you imply it's the same as if they don't get it, because you'll do it without it. And they're motivated not to do it. Guess what? The patient wants your car. Not only do they not want the sinus graft, they want your car. They want your income. What the hell does it matter what they want? <laughs> if you're trained by me, if you didn't do the sinus graft, you would charge three times more than it would cost to do the sinus graft and the longer implant. If I'm not doing the ideal treatment, I have three times a higher risk of failure, I'm going to charge it three times more. Give them a financial advantage to do the right thing. Well, how come you're going to charge me three times more? Because you're going to have three times higher failure rate. That's an honest approach. Rather than letting them have a motivation to do the wrong thing. When the implants, when I added all the good, the bad, the ugly in the studies, a meta-analysis, when the implants were less than 10 years long, it was a 16% failure. In addition to the early failure that occurs because of biomechanics, we have the mechanical problems in prosthetics. 
And these one to three year studies, there's very few five year studies on complications of prosthetics. I guess there's no money in it for the systems to be supported prosthetic studies. So they put their money into selling the implant body. Because once you put the implant body in, you've got to buy the prosthetics. They're not motivated to do studies on the prosthetics, longevity complications. Prosthetic screw loosening, 7%, was an average. Single teeth were higher, 8 to 20%. Implant design really influences that. Abutment screw loosening, 6%. Prosthetic screw fracture, 4%. Prosthetic abutment screw fracture. If I look at this study with priest, prosthetic broken screws, 1.8%. Loose screws, 7.1%. If I look at this study with Epfel, unacceptable loosening was observed in 4% of the prosthetic screws and 29% of the abutment screws. If I look at this study with ITI, 4.3 year period, the average screw loosening was 14%. If I look at a study by Tarnow's group, wide diameter implants at a 6% screw loosening, regular size implants at a 15% screw loosening. You decrease the stress by putting a wider implant in, you have less screw loosening. It's a biomechanical problem. It's not a toothbrush problem. And the case doesn't fail, but any of us know in prosthetics that a loose screw can cause you not only aggravation, but you may have to cut the crown off to tighten up the screw. Fracture, prosthetic loads may cause excessive stresses to implant components and implant bodies which result in fracture. Fatigue strength, the ultimate strength below which a material may be repetitively subjected for an infinite number of cycles without failure. This is your fatigue curve that you saw in freshman year in dental school. You have stress, force of area, on one axis. You have cycles rather than strain, as I showed you before on the other. There's a stress so high that one cycle, the material breaks. The hammer or a piece of glass, boom. There's a stress so low that no matter how many times you hit that piece of glass or the material, it doesn't break. It's below the endurance limit. This is where you want to live in prosthetics. But because your treatment plan is incorrect, incorrect number of implants, incorrect position of implants, treatment planning, in the Bruxer patient the same way as the non bruxer patient, treating planning the male the same way as the female, even though you know they have 25 pounds per square inch higher weight force, Testosterone doesn't only screw up their mind, it screws up their muscle mass. The things that increase stress, the amount of the force or the area, puts you more likely above the endurance limit. And after seven, nine years, boom, the material breaks. How many of us have had a patient say, I was dipping my donut in coffee this morning, put it in my mouth, then porcelain broke. And you're saying, come on, wet piece of donut broke this. Yeah, it's indeed the straw that breaks the camel's back. It's the cycles that fill. <coughs> and if you look at the natural dentition, out of the 439 cycles per day that the teeth come together, 314 cycles have three top, three force, the maximum bite force, and that's with patients without significant severe bruxism. And as a consequence, we get a resin veneer fracture of 22% of the time in the literature and the few studies reported. Ceramic veneer fracture, 8% of the time, within three years. Most likely a marginal ridge. And as a consequence, the prosthesis has to be redone. The implant didn't fail, but the prosthesis did. And the prosthetic screws fracture, and the abutment screws fracture, and the implant body fractures. Again, the good news is they typically don't fracture immediately, although I've had one patient that she ended up fracturing screws within the first year, and then the next year, and the next year, and the next year. Above the screws fracture less often because they're larger in diameter. But they fracture not because of bad hygiene. They fracture because of too much stress. Implant bodies fracture. Again, typically not the first year unless it's a replace while you're inserting it because the internal hex is now on a grade 2 titanium and it's so weak on the outer body that the implant actually fractures while you're putting it in. But many designs may fracture long term because of too much stress. If I look at the marginal bone loss, the, most, the thing that's most manipulated by our field is the marginal bone loss. Most every time I'm asked to talk about this topic, they give me 15, 20 minutes. 
And I'm allowed to talk about one aspect of this according to whatever the program director wants. Well, let me talk about this for 20 minutes instead of 10 minutes to give you a, a, a more full range of a picture because indeed many of your manufacturers design product to stop a complication that doesn't even exist. Let me address it. The etiologies of crestal bone loss are multifactorial. Surgical front, occlusal overload, implant design, bacteria, the micro gap, the biologic width. It's easier for a mature audience to understand this if you can do two things. One, put away the advertising hype that you've heard. And two, ask when does this type of bone loss occur most often? And by kind of ignoring the rhetoric of advertising, and then considering when you see this problem, it becomes more obvious that they all are part of the picture. You just have to look at what we're talking about and how much they influence the problem and what you can change and what God doesn't allow you to change. So I'm gonna look at the surgery healing period, the initial period after it's uncovered, the early loading period, the delayed loading period, and the long-term period. And I'm gonna separate these things into which one makes sense at what time. Surgical trauma. Surgical trauma can cause implant failure. We're aware of that, but rarely does it cause, does it cause failure. Surgical trauma can cause bone loss. I've heard people say that you get bone loss from reflecting the periosteum. In the perio literature, you lose 1.8 millimeters of bone, you reflect the periosteum. Excessive pressure at the crest because of the crest module drill or excessive pressure. So the crest module drill will cause crestal bone loss. The, the surgical factor of healing, surgical bone loss is gonna occur from surgery to the point you uncover it. And the vast majority of the time, this audience uncovers an implant in two-stage approach, you see no bone loss. You don't see 0.8 millimeters everywhere. See, if, if reflection of the periosteum was causing the bone loss, the whole ridge would be reduced a couple millimeters. And yet subperiosteal implants fit. You don't see bone loss in the whole crest every time you reflect the ridge. Therefore, the reflection of the periosteum is not the thing causing the bone loss, which means those people that tell you the one-stage surgical approach using the punch technique causes less bone loss because you don't reflect the periosteum is incorrect. Because the periosteum isn't causing the bone loss. And the reflection of it isn't causing the bone loss. The drills at the crest, yeah, it can cause a bone loss, but typically doesn't. See, when I look at studies that talk about how much bone loss there is from stage one surgery, they'll give you a range mostly around a millimeter. In the study we did with 12 operators, it was 0.2 millimeters. But let me show you our study and the study of mass. Mass from stage one surgery, stage one recovery, lost 0.8 to 0.2. 96 millimeters of bone, regardless of bone density. Very hard, hard, soft, very soft bone. But remember, this is an average number. It doesn't mean every implant lost a millimeter of bone. It's been misinterpreted to mean that, but that's not what the data means. For example, let me show you the study that Poor published with my faculty. This is the range of bone loss in this study, rather than just giving you the average. Indeed, the average was 0.2 millimeters. But see, there were implants that gained bone. There were implants that lost bone with about the same amount that canceled each other out. And then you got this implant sitting over here that screws up the whole data. That one implant screws up the whole data. See, if you have 10 implants and nine of them lose zero bone, but one of them lose four millimeters, well, the average bone loss is 0.4 millimeters. It doesn't mean that every implant lost four millimeters. And if you look at the average implant, they're not losing bone. It's the exception, not the rule. So surgical bone loss can be identified in a two-stage approach at uncovery. It can be part of the equation in a one-stage approach because you're making the implant surgery and putting it through the soft tissue at the same time. So it can be part of that early bone loss that you observe. 
Any early loading long loss, it can be part of that if it was an immediate load situation in which you're putting that on top of the two. But for the most, for most of the time, nine out of 10 times, surgical bone loss is not what we're talking about around an implant. So eliminating the countersinking drill and eliminating the periosteal reflection doesn't make sense. It's what's the exception? And the exception typically is something that becomes permucosal and the bacteria gets involved in it. That's why it loses so much. And that's another discussion. The most popular things that I hear people talk about that are supported by companies is the biologic width and micro gap. There are a number of implants that are advertised now that have less of a micro gap of everybody else, therefore automatically assuming less bone loss. Or they have a permucosal area that's above the bone and therefore less biologic width bone loss. So let me address these two issues. The biologic width. In my impression, the biologic width, a term that most periodontists will use, confuse, and use it as their secret handshake. And it starts our freshman year when they ask us, what is the width of keratinized tissue around the patient? And I can remember responding to the periodontist on the floor about four centimeters. He said, no, it's three millimeters. I said, you're measuring the height, not the width. Already they start messing with your brain. You don't even know what dimension width means. And then they publish the biologic width, which is a height measurement. And they don't measure the sulcus in their biologic width. That's confusing because in the implant literature they included the sulcus. And so all of a sudden you can't compare the two because one includes the sulcus and one doesn't in the literature. And they tell you the average is 9.97 and 1.07 and implying that this is a real number. They use terms like connective tissue attachment and epithelial attachment. Well, connective tissue attachment makes sense to you. See, there's 13 different fiber groups in the tissue if I count the superior fibers of the PDL that can physically insert, insert into the cementum of a tooth and therefore I would call that in an attachment. Epithelial attachment. Epithelial attachment is not an attachment. See, an epithelial attachment is broken with a probe, it's broken with air. It's not an attachment. I'll address that in a moment. Turnout now says the reason you lose bone around a tooth or an implant is because of the biologic width. See, when a crown margin invades the biologic width of 2.04 millimeters, the bone is lost to reestablish the biologic width. And therefore assume that the abutment implant connection acts like a crown margin, and therefore, because of the biologic width of the micro cap acting like a crown margin, you'll lose three millimeters of bone, including the sulcus, around an implant to establish the biologic width. And the only way that you can prevent this is if you take the micro gap and put it high, and therefore the biologic width is away from the bone and you're not losing the bone from the biologic width of the micro gap. So let's look at the biologic width of an implant and the biologic width of a tooth and rationalize and look at the data to see is this something we have to worry about or pick an implant for. See, Cochran and others say that the biologic width around implants is three millimeters. Berglund and Lundy say it's three to four point eight. Well, let's measure it first with a tooth. You put a probe in the tooth sulcus, it goes right to the epithelial attachment. It's stopped by the connective tissue attachment. But the epithelial attachment doesn't stop. You blow air in the sulcus. The epithelial attachment comes off. You pack a cord in the sulcus. The epithelial attachment comes off. In other words, this is not an attachment. The epithelial attachment is just a close approximation. It's not attached to anything. So why is the body going to cause bone loss to attach nothing? It's not an attachment. Now why this is relevant in our field, because next to an implant, there, are, there is no connective tissue attachment. Instead of having 13 different fiber groups, of which six insert into the cementum of a tooth, there are only two fiber groups, and neither one of them insert. There is only an epithelial attachment. 
And the epithelial attachment is not an attachment. It is a hemidesmosome of either on a tooth or on an implant. And a hemidesmosome with a lamina loose and a lamina densa. What does this mean? In English, my hand is not attached to the podium. See, I move my hand, it's, the podium doesn't come with it, it's not attached. It's close approximation. You say, oh, there's a mucopolysaccharide. My hand is still not attached to the podium. It's not an attachment. And as a consequence, you probe next to an implant, you probe the bone. It's not an attachment. The body doesn't have to cause bone loss to attach nothing to it. And indeed, not every implant loses three millimeters of bone. Let's look at the microgap that's acting as a crown margin. The microgap, which is really the abutment implant connection, in the literature was introduced by ITI in an advertisement saying that they didn't have a micro gap because their implant was above the bone. And the micro gap out of the advertisement came into our field because their major speakers started talking about the micro gap of the implant above the connection and that they didn't have one in their one stage implant. So I measured the micro gap of the five most common implants sold in the United States, different manufacturers. And the space there is zero. Now, I don't know about you, but the term gap implies a space. Micro gap would be small space. This is zero. That ain't a gap. That's a connection. The same gap exists on the cover screw. And when the cover screw is put at or below the bone and covered with tissue, bone grows over the gap. The gap isn't causing three millimeter bone loss, otherwise you see it at the uncovering. The connection didn't cause the bone loss. Danny Boozer's book. Danny Boozer's a guy that says you lose three millimeters of bone from the micro gap. This is his book. The implants uncovered, there's bone at the top of the cover screw. And the cover screw gap is the same size as the button screw gap. Zero. It's not a gap, it's an advertising term. Well, how can you have a company tell you they have less of a micro gap when the number is zero? In fact, people sell instruments to remove the bone to get off the cover screw. Because the bone grows over that connection all the time. Is this micro gap or is this implant design? In other words, is this bone loss by God or bone loss influenced by man? Well, let's look at it. Let's look at the study that's been regurgitated to show that ITI has less bone loss with the Herman study. And they have seven different implants of which five of them are two-stage. But they had two implants that nobody talked about. The two implants that are one piece. One piece, no gap at all. They're just one piece. One with a rough surface at the crest of the ridge, one with a rough surface a millimeter and a half below the ridge. And these implants are followed for six months with no load. They're not restored, they're not loaded. When the rough surface is at the crest of the ridge, at the bony crest, six months later, the bone is still there. When the rough surface is put a millimeter and a half below the bone crest, the first month they lose a millimeter and a half of bone and then it stays at the rough surface. The bone loss here is not from the gap, not from the biologic width, but by machine or smooth metal put below the bone when it's pervipulsive. You take a TPS, titanium plasma spray, and a receding surface. The same implant design, design but one, the rough surface is put at the crest, and the other is smooth surface put at the crest. When the rough surface is put at the crest with no loading, now, the bone is maintained at the crest with early healing. And when the smooth surface, it goes down in the first thread. The first thread of the rough surface determines how much bone you're going to lose when you put smooth or machine metal below the bone. That's an implant design, not a biologic width of God. <coughs> you pick an implant that has a smooth metal put below the bone, the bone is lost in the first thread even before you start the prosthesis. 
not because of the biologic width, but because you have smooth the machine metal you put below the bone. You determine that, not God. That's not a biologic function. That's a man influence function. And if you countersink the implant below the bone, when you add the abutment permucosal, the bone goes down below the connection to the area that's first struck or first thread. Therefore, don't countersink the implant if you don't want to give up the crest of bone. And don't put smooth metal below it. And yet I see articles by major clinicians that we have on the podium at our major meetings <laughs> that will tell you to countersink the implant to the implant diameter is the same as the tooth root dimension. And they'll use an implant that has smooth metal at the crest. And then you look at their clinical cases and there's bone to the area that's 